So welcome everyone. The Granby Public Library and Granby Land Trust are pleased to present Moose in Connecticut. This is featuring our special guest presenter, Andrew M. Labonte. Mr. Labonte is a wildlife biologist specializing in deer and moose with the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. So tonight he's going to cover the history, current status and future expectations of uh, the moose population in our state. We're gonna learn about the biology of the animal. It is the largest animal or mammal in Connecticut. And so let's get right to the presentation and give a warm welcome to Andy Labonte. Welcome, Mr. Labonte, we're glad you're here. Thank you very much for that welcome. I'm glad to be here uh, and able to provide you with this presentation. Hope everyone uh, enjoys it and is able to stay awake uh, throughout the entire presentation. Hopefully I can answer all your questions here at the end. You will be able to see me uh, during the presentation. There will be several photos of me and you'll get to see me here at the end of, end of the presentation when I'm fielding the questions. So you could speak up there, buddy. Are they able, able to hear me? I think we're good. OK. Thought I heard somebody did. I, yeah, okay. somebody was listening, looking for a little bit louder. Um, if you can pop it up a little bit, I guess that would help. Um, folks, you can control your audio volume as well. Try to make it a little louder. All right, well, today I'm going to talk about moose in Connecticut. The history, status, and future expectations. Um, just to let you know, I try to put the uh, town in which the photos come from in the lower corner of the image, um, just so you can all see where the photos come from uh, that I've gotten over the years, some of which I have taken personally, and a lot of which have come from uh, folks like yourselves who have taken various photos and sent them to me, uh, which I've shared with you here for this presentation. Seem to be stuck here. So I usually give these presentations in person. Uh, so to keep people from falling asleep, I like to kind of keep it interactive by asking lots of different questions. But obviously, since we're doing this online, I'll test your knowledge and you'll kind of have to keep nudging yourself at home, um, you know, just to make sure you stay awake. But uh, just to give you a little bit of background history, uh, about moose. Uh, let me ask if anyone knows how many different subspecies there are that are found in the northern hemisphere. There are actually seven different subspecies that can be found in the northern hemisphere. And there are four different subspecies that are found in North America. We actually have uh, what's known as the Eastern Moose here in New England and in Connecticut, shown here in the pink. We have the Northeastern Moose, which is shown in the green, which is primarily found in most of the Canadian provinces. As you can imagine, the Alaskan Moose is primarily found in Alaska, shown in a kind of magenta color. And then the Shearer's Moose, uh, which is found in the Canadian Rockies. And all the subspecies have very subtle differences, and mainly being their body size and antler characteristics, with the Alaskan moose being uh, the largest body size and the Shearer's moose being the smallest. Now talking specifically about size, uh, can anyone guess how tall moose can get? And just because uh, obviously we're doing this virtually, uh, you can't tell how tall I am. I'd like to tell you that I stand six foot tall, but obviously I'd be lying to you. 
over the years, I've been saying I'm roughly 5'10". My wife says, you're full of baloney. You're more like 5'8". But uh, I do suffer from a degenerative brain disease. So the answer probably lies somewhere in between there. Uh, but if you guess somewhere around six foot tall at the shoulder, you're pretty close to being correct. Any guesses on how much a moose can weigh? And this varies quite a bit. Moose can weigh up to 1,400 pounds, which is typically uh, the Alaskan moose, which is the largest. Uh, the largest moose that I've handled in Connecticut was roughly around 850 pounds. And clearly the individual in this photo who happens to be myself uh, is not of right mind because anyone with even a partially functioning brain uh, wouldn't be trying to stop a seven or 800 pound moose uh, on an 880 pound frame. Uh, back in the day when I was, you know, trying to prevent this moose from traveling any further in this particular situation, I was doing competitive bodybuilding. And not only did I have inflammation of the brain, but obviously I had inflammation of the ego as well. Now, although I couldn't physically get this particular moose to stop, it did pay close attention to the stop sign, uh, which is surprising because if you have any knowledge of moose, they don't particularly have very good eyesight, but the moose did stop. Um, but if they wanted to, they are capable of running at speeds upward of 35 miles an hour, which may be surprising to many people. Um, And shocking to many is the number of years and how long moose can live, uh, which can be upwards of 20 years. But in most cases, similar to deer who can also live 20 years, they don't typically live much longer than 12 to 15 years. Uh, and that's in a pretty, pretty good lifestyle uh, if they live that long. So we really can't go without speaking about it much these days. I'm talking about social distancing and social interaction. So unlike humans and deer, for example, moose are relatively individualistic animals that don't require a lot of social interaction, except when you talk about mothers and their offspring and males and females during the breeding season. The breeding season, occurs from late September through October and females can breed when they're a year and a half old unlike deer which can breed at six months and females commonly give birth to single calves in May and June and under real good scenarios they can give birth to twins as shown here in the bottom left hand photo Any idea how much food a moose can typically eat in a given day? And when I'm speaking to this, I'm talking about adults only. They can consume 40 to 60 pounds of food in a single day. So year round, moose consume all types of different trees and shrubs and they typically like to eat uh, what's referred to as moose maple or striped maple, uh, red maple, such as seen in the photo here uh, that I'm standing next to. But mostly uh, species that are less than 20 years of age uh, is what they prefer to consume. In this particular photo, we were actually out trying to capture moose uh, during the breeding season and we watched an adult bull moose uh, try to feed on this red maple for over an hour and they use their lower incisors basically to strip the bark off this particular 
uh, red maple. And usually if you see that kind of browsing on these trees, it's usually not the greatest sign of high quality moose habitat. During the spring and summer, moose also consume aquatic vegetation and lakes and ponds. Uh, and they also use those areas to escape the heat and biting insects. And I have to say, I personally haven't seen uh, moose in the water ever in my lifetime. And I did go to college in Maine for four years in which I never saw a single moose. Uh, but my college roommate a few years ago did capture this moose uh, where he got this excellent photo uh, and sent it to me of not only a moose in water, but also consuming the aquatic vegetation, uh, which provides great nutrients for them. And they are sodium dependent. So they often during the wintertime, that's why you see them along the highways uh, on their knees, licking the salt off the roads and is one of the reasons why it is a safety concern in which they have changed over from using uh, salt on the highways up in Maine to um, other type of materials is to reduce moose vehicle accidents. So now that I've given you some specifics about moose, now I'm going to start talking about moose populations and specifically those in northern New England in Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire. And those populations were abundant in the 1600s. However, by the 1800s, they had declined considerably uh, due to habitat loss and unregulated hunting. In the late 1800s, the abandonment of agriculture and changes in forest practices essentially allowed for the regeneration of forest stands, providing increased habitat for moose. And the lack of predators and restricted hunting laws essentially allowed for moose populations to increase throughout the 1900s. Moose populations in Northern New England exceeded 30,000 moose at that time. And moose who began dispersing in random directions came south into Massachusetts and Connecticut. And moose had been extirpated from Massachusetts and Connecticut in the 1800s, if one ever really existed in the state. So, in Connecticut, it's really unclear whether moose were ever native to Connecticut, because really there's little historical evidence, um, except for some writings that they were present in the northwest corner of the state, because there haven't been any archaeological deposits uh, found, indicating that if moose really were ever here, they were uh, likely present in very low numbers. But there has been increasing number of reports in both Mass and Connecticut since the 1980s. And current estimates of 1,000 to 1,500 moose are what's been reported recently in Massachusetts. And as of right now, there's no hunting seasons that exist in Mass or Connecticut. So what's the current status of moose in Connecticut and what's Connecticut been doing? So here in Connecticut, one of our objectives was to document the establishment, expansion and distribution of moose in the state. So in 1992, we began keeping better track of public moose sightings and moose vehicle accidents. So although we encourage the public to report moose sightings, we recommend that members of the public keep their distance from moose, specifically running bulls such as this one, uh, because of obviously of their size, as I mentioned, uh, the size of their antlers. Uh, they are extremely unpredictable. 
specifically during the breeding season. We recommend keeping your distance, obviously from cows with calves, because obviously as any mother can attest, your mother, the mothers are gonna be very protective of their offspring. If you do happen to find yourself um, too close to an animal, always try to find a large tree, an object uh, to put yourself uh, between you and the animal. And if safe, we do always recommend, you know, taking a photograph either with your phone or your camera, cell phone or a camera. Share it with us either via email, text message, through the DEP website, any way possible. Um, a lot of photos in this presentation were shared by uh, Jake the Moose Man Harton, who's maybe even watching this presentation, but I know he spends a lot of time in the woods and is in communication with me quite frequently and shares a lot of photos that he's taken over the years. So I appreciate him uh, taking those photos and sharing all the stories that he's had um, with moose encounters over the, over the years. So kudos to him for getting a chance to be out in the woods and spending more time than I get even to spend out there viewing moose and having those interactions. So definitely uh, if you get the chance to share, share the photos, share the experiences. I always enjoy hearing about them. So based on those sightings, the distribution of moose sightings over the first eight years that we were recording that, moose sightings were recorded in 30 different towns, averaged six sightings a year, which is what we call the establishment period. Over the next 15 years, sightings were received from 127 different towns and averaged about 76 sightings a year, which we consider the growth period. And during this time, there were 39 sightings reported in the town of Granby. The next five years of public sighting data shows there are sightings in 56 towns with an average of 65 sightings per year, where it seems the population seemed to level off or the novelty of seeing a moose is worn off, which is one of the drawbacks from using public sightings. Uh, we also haven't had a lot of uh, moose dispersing south during that period of time in the spring. Uh, where we were seeing previously. So that could be also another reason for the decline in sightings and why there's not as many towns showing up anymore. Um, and during this period of time, there were 41 sightings in the town of Granby. In addition to using public sightings, we began looking at hunter sightings of moose. And in 1996, question was added to the annual deer hunter survey. During the past 23 year period, moose are observed in 103 different towns. And the important thing here on this map is the areas where the black circles showing the towns where the sightings occurred six of the last 10 years. And this gives you a better idea where the core population of moose uh, seems to exist, mainly along the Massachusetts border. And one thing of uh, importance to us was knowing if Connecticut actually had a resident moose population. So one way of doing that was to use cow-calf sightings. And can anyone name the particular area here that's circled in red? 
And as you might expect, it's obviously called the vulva patch, uh, which makes identifying female moose relatively easy. If that's all you happen to see on a moose that might be fleeing away from you, it's light in color, as you see here in the picture, as opposed to dark in color on a male moose, which I'll show you later. In 2000, we had our first reported cow-calf sighting in the town of Heartland. And from 1998 to 2018, we had about 65 individual calf sightings in 17 towns, mainly along the Massachusetts border and primarily in the town of Heartland. indicating that we had an established uh, moose population. And as you can see, we had five of those sightings in the town of Granby. We had an additional 22 calf sightings <clears throat> reported in 10 additional towns in the past three years, shown in the darker green from 99 to 2021. And there was an additional sighting in Granby, many additional sightings in Heartland and a few other of the same towns that had been previously reported. So you might be wondering why there's so many sightings in the town of Heartland. And the main reason is because, for one, it obviously borders Massachusetts, where the population has been expanding. Uh, and the other is that there's a lot of protected forest lands, mainly owned by MDC, where they do a lot of timber harvest, creating a lot of early successional habitat, uh, where there's a lot of forest regeneration, providing that food source uh, that moose really need for survival. And I was very happy to hear that there'll be a presentation at the next go around talking about forests and uh, stuff like that and how this is very similar to what's going on in Connecticut that pretty much most of Connecticut forest lands are all in stable uh, community and not a lot of early successional habitat. So you'll get to learn more about that in the, in the next presentation. Uh, so how that changes over time is gonna really affect moose populations down the road. So. That'll be interesting. I um, might have to join that presentation just to hear what is being said about that in, in the future. So now that we knew we had an established moose population in Connecticut, as that population continues to grow, we see more and more dispersing moose, and these moose can travel five to 10 miles a day. So if only moose were as smart as this particular elitist from the Mrs. Porter's school in Farmington and all of them used a crosswalk, it wouldn't be such a concern to us. Uh, however, not every one of them is that smart. For example, this moose uh, got trapped in an urban area in Plainville in a fenced in area that we captured, marked it, and relocated it to the moose capital of Connecticut, which we call Heartland, in June of 2012. And then it showed up in Burlington in September and went on a 34 mile jaunt, uh, likely in search of a female to breed. 
before returning to the general area where it was released to previously. Um, but as I looked at this map more closely, it actually returned to Granby on 5-26-2013. That was the last known reported sighting that we had. So it, its last location was there in Granby where you guys are. So I haven't heard from it since. I'm not sure what happened to it, but it's up there where you guys are at. If anybody's seen it, please let me know. There are many other dispersals uh, that didn't end so well, such as this one here in Eastern Connecticut, one here in Central and Southern Connecticut, and this one here in Western Connecticut that all ended in a moose vehicle accident. So this map here essentially shows the distribution of moose vehicle collisions shown specifically with the black dots. Uh, which have mainly been in northern Connecticut. Now I circled the cluster here in the town of Heartland because that's primarily where most of them have been. And you'll also note that I did circle the one of particular interest that happened in New Canaan in 2007. So what are the challenges that we face and motorists face when it comes to dealing with moose? Well, typically moose are most active at dusk and dawn or periods with lower light conditions. They're relatively dark in color, making them more difficult to see. They're extremely large animals that stand much taller than deer. So when someone comes along, uh, headlights on the vehicles don't typically shine on their eyes like they might on a deer. And as this photo obviously indicates, when they are struck by a vehicle, they end up landing on the hood or in the front windshield. And in this particular instance in New Canaan, a motorist that was involved ironically happened to be from New Hampshire, uh, was probably the least thought on their mind that they were going to strike a moose on the Merritt Parkway uh, in southern Connecticut in the middle of the daytime. And I happened to be down there at this time. We were tracking this moose, tracking its movements, and we were there just after this incident occurred. In this photo that I took, the woman was still trapped in the vehicle. Um, the moose landed on the roof, crushed the, crushed the roof. Ironically, when I looked at this photo again today, I hadn't really thought about it much before, but there's no blood on the pavement or on the car, but the moose is just to the left of the new Canaan Fire Department officer shoulder there, uh, the moose went off the side of the road, injured all its legs and had to be euthanized. Uh, but as you can see in the photo of uh, this moose riding in the front seat, uh, that moose is still alive and in the front seat of the car, riding like a passenger would. So any of these situations that involve a moose in a vehicle are extremely challenging and often do not result uh, well for driver or moose. The next objective that we had was to evaluate landscape suitability by looking at habitat and temperature. Pop quiz for this particular one. Is this a male or a female based on the previous information that I gave to you? And depending on how quality or imagery is on a computer might give it away. But uh, this one here is a male because it does not have a vulva patch and it has antlers, but 
some computer you might not be able to distinguish that very easily. And also in older males, this one here is relatively young. Um, older males will have what's known as stockings, which is the lower leg will be much lighter in color. There'll be a separation right where I have that red line, which turns into a much darker uh, hair on the upper hind quarters. So that would be known as the stockings on the lower half. Just another way of distinguishing the male from a female. So we used a habitat suitability model to evaluate potential areas where moose may exist based on their resource requirements. And due to limited habitat, mainly lack of conifers and regeneration, along with the high temperatures, because moose are very susceptible to heat stress. In the summer, anytime temperatures are over 60 degrees Fahrenheit, or anytime temperatures during the wintertime are above 23 degrees Fahrenheit, moose seek out areas where there's heavy conifers to, to get out of that solar radiation, um, in which we don't have a lot of outside of northern Connecticut, it's going to be unsuitable habitat for moose. So essentially what this model shows, the areas up here are the most suitable habitat for moose. Anywhere in the gray or any area that's shown in the white is essentially unsuitable. So pretty much where we've had moose the last 20 years is where we'll continue to have moose uh, likely for the remainder of its um, lifetime here in the state, should things continue to stay how they are. If global warming continues to change, the likelihood is that that area may even continue to shrink more so than it already is. The next objective was to develop a minimum population estimate based on public and hunter sightings of moose and predict future population growth. So in 2008, you developed a population estimate of 73 moose. And based on that model, the estimate was expected to grow to approximately 258 moose in a 20 year period. Based on everything we've learned so far from all the work that we've done recently, those numbers are pretty unlikely, probably more like Currently, here in 2020, we're somewhere between 100 and 150 moose, including males and females. And it seems pretty unlikely that we're going to reach 258 moose um, in the 20 year mark. Not to say that we couldn't, but certainly things uh, in the future with a lot of the population constraints that other states are seeing and what we're seeing, uh, we don't expect we're gonna, we're gonna see those numbers. And I'll, I'll get into that in the next batch of slides here towards the end of the presentation. So the final objective was to look at the movements, habitat use, and population constraints. So how are we going to go about doing that? Well, at the time, some newer technology had just come out. 
Uh, we're going to capture moose, attach GPS tracking collars, and put ear tags on the moose uh, so we could monitor their movements. So we purchased these GPS tracking collars uh, along with one of the Canadian provinces and Massachusetts. Several thousand dollars per collar, top of the line technology. Uh, it was going to be a, a great investment in, in research and information. So when it comes to capturing moose, at least in Connecticut, uh, we were going to uh, resort to capturing them from a helicopter and darting them with a tranquilizer gun. So I'd fly around searching for moose when there was snow cover present and dart them from the air. Then I'd radio to the ground crew who was waiting on standby in a relatively close by area. And I would guide them into finding the animals on the ground or if it was somewhere that was visible enough, we'd land the helicopter nearby and then I would go on the ground and essentially we'd go in and locate the animals. So we were able to capture our first bull moose in 2009 in the Heartland Bark Hampstead line, uh, which was estimated to be about an 800 pound bull. We captured a 450 pound female in Heartland that same winter and a 700 pound uh, bull in Southbury later on in the fall that got itself into another urban situation. In 2010, we captured another 800 pound bull in Heartland. And then um, in 2011, we unknowingly recaptured the same cow again since it had lost its collar a couple of years earlier. Uh, that weighed 677 pounds in the same area we had originally captured it. And this particular time was actually pretty exciting because we were able to go out there with a filming crew uh, for Nat Geo Wild. So they followed us around. I had a GoPro on my helmet and one mounted on the helicopter. and. They were out there with us for four days with the film crew and the production went on TV and you can find it on Nat Geo Wild called Moose Rampage. Uh, unfortunately, it cost money to watch it, uh, but it was a interesting and exciting kind of adventure and we were able to actually, and fortunate that we were able to capture moose during the time period in which it allowed uh, for them to be out there with us. So kind of an interesting and exciting moment uh, for a, a couple of us here in Connecticut, just to be able to be a part of that project. We captured a few other animals as well during that time period, but as I mentioned, because of all the malfunctions with the equipment. We put a lot of effort into capturing these animals. It really didn't gleam a great deal of information about the movements. We did get some information I share it here with you on this map of little value it has, but some interesting stuff. Um, the first moose we captured, which is the adult bull number two, shown here in kind of the the pink color that utilized kind of a, a 10 mile strip along the northwest portion of the reservoir and never moved any further south of where we captured it, pretty much just along the reservoir all the way up into Massachusetts. The female number 176, shown in blue, pretty much stayed right around the clear cut capture site area, moved some south, uh, but because of the malfunctioning equipment didn't really generate very much 
in the way of data points. And then the last bull 24 in which we captured the in the yellow stayed kind of in the same general clear cut area and spent some time up in Massachusetts as well. The, the data points are only a very short period of time. Uh, so there's not a, a great deal of data to, to look at there. I think the longest one that was on the air was bull number two. I think that might be uh, nine months of data. The rest of them are all very short amount of time, only a few months worth of data. So what's the future of moose in Connecticut? Unfortunately, you could say it's partially constrained. Um, but on a serious note, can anyone really venture a guess as to why that population is constrained? Unfortunately, there's just a lot of population constraints on the moose here at the southern extent of the range, obviously being the first one. Uh, they are at the southern extent of the range. But firstly, and primarily is going to be disease. And that disease uh, is brainworm. Uh, moose are extremely susceptible to brainworm, which is transmitted through a process which involves deer, snails, and slugs. Uh, the parasite rarely impacts deer, but is nearly almost always fatal in moose. And this particular one here in Granby uh, was exhibiting signs of brainworm and needed to be euthanized. Uh, just back a couple of years ago, uh, actually in 2020. We had reports of this moose standing on the road, oblivious to traffic, oblivious to people. It was a three-year-old moose that should have weighed roughly about 800 pounds. Uh, when we brought it in uh, for investigation, it only weighed around 525 pounds. Uh, based on necropsy at Yukon, it had inflammation of the brain and parasites. Um, my wife can say, you know, based on experience personally from myself, I lost a lot of weight didn't know where I was, had fluid build up on my brain. Uh, and in this photo here that I took, this selfie of this moose here in Granby, uh, this was after I had gone through brain surgery, suffering all those same things. Um, and I was recovering from that. I just happened to be fortunate enough where obviously we have the medical capabilities of dealing with those symptoms. And unfortunately for moose, we don't have those abilities uh, to treat those kind of conditions in the field. That's the unfortunate thing. Um, you know, in a wildlife situation, those, those things, we don't have those treatment options. Uh, when people say, you know, they feel bad for you because of my situation or my medical condition, you know, I'm happy to say, you know, how many people can tell you they've been able to dart a moose from a helicopter or been able to be on that geo wild. I'm not doing the greatest. But these things, you know, I'm able to talk about and things could be much worse. So I'm still here talking about them and I'm grateful for that. So it makes me happy to still be here to talk about these things. So I, I feel blessed for that. Unfortunately for moose, 
another major limiting factor because they are primarily a northern species they got to deal with heat stress from the research that i did for my masters which is on moose 56 to 82 percent of the time temperatures in connecticut are above the threshold tolerable for moose which can occur during the summer and even more so during the winter so when moose dispersed to connecticut it wasn't because they were thinking it was going to be better for retirement or leaving Massachusetts because of the high tolls or because of the high taxes. They just naturally disperse in random directions. They certainly weren't thinking they were moving south for better living conditions. So um, when folks are moving to Florida, it's their own decision most of the time to go there. Moose don't have that opportunity to go there and test the waters before they come here. It's just a natural dispersal effect. Another issue for moose is winter ticks or moose ticks. This particular moose in the photo is the one that we captured back in 2009. And if you notice in the photo in the upper right, you can see a patch of hair missing. And in the lower right, you see a person's hand uh, with the ticks crawling all over it. If you magnify that to a wider scale, you'll see what's known as ghost moose, which is when a moose rubs up against trees that removes a bunch of patches of hair that goes missing from irritation uh, from the biting insects. So the, the skin of the moose gets so irritated from the ticks feeding on them, they essentially rub themselves bare to relieve that itching and ultimately end up removing all the hair from their bodies. It's been reported that, the, that as many as 100,000 ticks uh, found on a single moose. And you can imagine the exposure to the elements from lack of hair and the blood loss uh, caused by these feeding ticks. And it can have a major impact on the moose's survival. Recent studies in New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine are currently going on now, looking at the effects of climate change and how it's leading to drastic uh, reductions in the moose population, where they think they're down more than 50% from where they were in the 1990s. So as I mentioned previously, limited quality of habitat in Connecticut, one being a lack of conifers, which provides uh, moose with the cover from solar radiation, habitat loss in general, which could simply be lack of regenerating forest stands, aging of forest stands, habitat loss simply due to building, um, putting in homes, essentially making any habitat um, or land unsuitable period. As I mentioned, certainly vehicle collisions present problems for human safety. Also another factor can limit population growth. In some years, we've had as many as six moose vehicle accidents uh, have occurred in one year. Not only can deer impact uh, moose from the transfer of disease, uh, they can also eat similar foods and create competition with moose and deer for various resources. Although there's no hunting here in Connecticut or Massachusetts, there is over harvesting issues, uh, concerns about over harvesting to the point where those reductions in the moose population due to disease and tick concerns uh, has led states such as Vermont to completely stop moose hunting for at least a year or two, just so it wouldn't 
uh, additionally impact that population. Predation from bears and wolves is a factor in some states and some provinces, but mainly in the north, obviously. And although Connecticut's bear population is growing, um, it could be a limiting factor, most likely probably on calf survival here in, in the state of Connecticut. Uh, it may impact adult survival, but probably unlikely. One thing that's extremely bizarre, uh, don't know if any other states have, have found this or not, but we've had multiple reports of moose, unfortunately, falling into old abandoned wells in the state. And I think the the few that have been found and were reported have since been covered with something. Uh, so, so at least those particular ones that were found didn't end up uh, causing additional uh, mortalities to moose on the landscape. So unfortunately, what's the future of moose uh, in the state? And if this is any indication, uh, I would say, unfortunately, it's very grim. But when uh, resources are slim, you take what you can get. And as I said, you take what you can get. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I'd be happy to take any questions anybody has. And if I don't get to those questions, certainly feel free to address them at the email address below. Um, and thank you for your time. Well, Andrew, that was absolutely fascinating, informative. I that was you really covered everything. I mean, I we don't have a lot of questions in the chat because you did such a thorough presentation. Um, does anybody does anybody have a question? You can either submit it via chat or you can perhaps raise your hand or something and, and then we call on you and you can unmute and ask it live. Um, but oh, we're getting all kinds of thank yous from our attendees, which is wonderful. I, and, and so you're going to have to share with us, Andrew, a little bit of the backstory for this photo. I did have somebody ask me about it earlier today. Um, they thought you were um, like the moose whisperer, but I, um, I said I knew there was more to the story. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, sure. It's uh, that female moose, as you can see, it does have the bulb of patch and no antlers. Um, it was a young female that we captured and we gave it a reversal drug and we all moved to happen to go down near a stream. So we moved to the other side of the stream so the moose wouldn't get up and go into the stream. So we moved to the other side of the stream when it started coming around and the moose got up and came over and went in the stream unlike we expected it to. So we moved it out of the stream and it got up and went back in the stream again. It kept doing the opposite of what we expected it to do. And then we said, well, it's gonna do whatever it wants to do. So we started walking away and for whatever reason, it started following us through the woods where it actually ran right up to me. And as you can see, based on the expression on my face, <laughs> I didn't really know what was about to happen. And it put its head right on my shoulder and after it did that, it laid back down. Then it got back up and continued to follow us through the woods to the point where we were concerned that it was going to go out towards the main road. Yeah. And if you're familiar with Paul Rigo, who probably has given some bear presentations maybe over there, <laughs> he actually ran back into the woods and the moose ran after him and he hid in the woods and then he ran back out. <laughs> so it was just a young moose. I don't know really what to say about it, um, but it is the one we recaptured 
and it didn't didn't have much love for me the second time around it it got up and ran away like it should have so it was just a it was a fortunate um event that was captured on film and on camera by somebody which just unique experience i guess well um that that sounds like fun <laughs> that's a once in a lifetime um so we did get a few more questions um yeah. while you were um explaining the the photo um one of them is how about moose vocalization what do they sound like what what are their calls like uh they vary but for the most part it's uh kind of a like that's a typical call that you might hear you know during the season calves have a much more like whinier type of call it sounded pretty authentic to me. <laughs> so so um, I was waiting for one a, to come I up to the back door. I have a call that I bring with me when I do these live that people can play with. And you can make them with a coffee can. So I usually bring a coffee can with me uh, to let people try it with a coffee can. So if you look up how to make a moose call with a coffee can, that kind of gives you a good idea and you can hear it for a really long ways away when you're in the woods that's great i'll have to google recommend, that later i recommend looking up how to make a coffee can moose call we're going to hear that call all over granby in the, this weekend <laughs> um so never we had a lot of luck with it but <laughs> there were some other questions too um about whether there have been ever been any sightings of moose in the McLean Game Refuge in Granby, or maybe Canton and Simsbury. And then um, also if there have been any moose attacks of humans in Connecticut, other than what we're seeing here with your photo. And that really doesn't qualify for a true attack. No, that's definitely not an attack. Uh, there have been some, not any recent ones that I remember in McLean Get Game Refuge, but I know in the past there have been several in the refuge uh, and as far as attacks go no real attacks we spent a lot of time out tracking moose over those years when we were doing a lot of research and we spent a lot of time in very close proximity to large bull moose and i'm talking 20 yards away for hours at a time trying to capture the right moose like we wanted to capture a female and they were always positioned in the wrong manner and we would at the end of the day when we couldn't get the right moose we'd say well what are we going to do now and sometimes we would have a standoff with them with the bull that we already had captured when we wanted the female and a lot of times, just like a bear, they might bluff charge you or kind of blow at you, stomp at you, and it's certainly intimidating, uh, but they never actually physically charged at us. And I, I don't recall ever hearing about one any other time, you know, doing that to another individual either. But certainly during the breeding season, is when they're unpredictable and you you don't want to, you don't want to put yourself in in those shoes. So I'm sorry to interrupt, Andrew. Um, but speaking of the breeding season, we also had another question about when the moose are likely to be most active. So perhaps maybe that's when we might see them out and about more often. Is there a a season when that that happens? September through October, mid-September through October is when they're most active. That's during the breeding season. So that's when they're most active in early morning uh, when it's cool. So just based on when I was flying in the helicopter, anytime it was over like 32 degrees, the moose were hardly ever out in the open. They were always like, 
in the hemlocks in the thick habitat. But when it was cooler than that, they'd be out in the clear cut areas feeding. So that's the unfortunate thing with the temperature is not real suitable for them. It kind of limits their opportunity when they feed. So, you know, when it's when it's really cold out, that's ideal for them. Um, and they'd be out feeding. But when it's warm, even when it's slightly above freezing, it's still too warm for them. So when it's really cold, <laughs> and so your best opportunity is early morning. And September, October is your best time period to be looking for them. OK. Thank or if, you. if there's fresh snow on the ground, obviously, you can find tracks. That would be another ideal time. Okay, well, that's that's uh, that narrows that down for us. We'll keep our eyes open. Um, one uh, circling back to the um, the ticks. Someone was asking um, if you could elaborate or maybe um, go over again the the ticks that cause all those problems for the moose. They look more like dog ticks than they do deer ticks. They're much larger and they they spend their entire life cycle on the moose unlike deer ticks which feed on multiple species uh, so uh, deer ticks feed on a mouse to get their first blood meal and then for their second stage of life they would feed on a larger mammal like a deer the moose tick spend its entire life cycle just on the moose. So that's why they can find so many ticks just on the moose. Um, and they're mainly found in the northern portions, you know, northern part of the state. So you don't typically find them farther south in the state. Like I've never seen them in the southern portions of Connecticut. Not that they couldn't be down here, but I've never really seen them in the south. So pretty much in moose range is where you would find them. Okay, well, thank you. That helps out. Um, and Andrew, I'm not sure I saw uh, the, the email address that you were referring to. Um, was that if folks had questions for you directly, they should contact you directly? Uh, they can, it's just Andrew dot labonte at ct.gov right okay it's on the bottom of the thing if it's still up okay 